All right, folks, welcome back to the channel and to a new episode of Fresh Finds Fridays. This week, I'm excited to show you the spoils of a two and a half week road trip through the Midwest that I just got back from. I uh, went up through Wisconsin and down through Kansas and then back to Connecticut. And I hit a lot of antique stores along the way and also visited some private collectors uh, that I've become acquainted with through the Gulf Heritage Society. Uh, which I, by the way, def highly recommend you join. Uh, it's the best way to get connected with people who have the club you might be looking for, uh, in addition to stuff you didn't even know you were looking for that you start collecting, uh, which is the case with me. Uh, but anyhow, um, I ended up coming back with 72 clubs, which makes it one of the most lucrative road trips I've had, uh, though that's a little deceiving because I didn't find all these clubs in antique stores like I have uh, in the past. Uh, several of these clubs came from those private collectors that I just mentioned, uh, who know now what I'm looking for, uh, which are primarily playable clubs or, you know, that, or clubs that can become playable for beginner sets and, um, now gutty sets. So the, uh, prime objective on this trip was to, for me, was to find smooth face clubs. Um, ideally they would be pre-1900 if I could find them. Uh, but I've kind of expanded my search to look for clubs that are smooth face, but probably, you know, between 1900 and 1910. Um, and there are certain clubs that I'm looking for, even in that range, uh, that still holds most of the characteristics of a gutty club. Um, those are kind of hard to define, uh, but you can kind of tell when you see a club, uh, certain makers after 1900 were still using some of the old world or gutty uh, era techniques in building their, their smooth face clubs. And um, there's kind of a transition point between 1900 and 1905 or so uh, that coincides with the Haskell ball, which is the first rubber cord ball. Um, when that ball came on the scene and made the gutty, gutta percha ball obsolete, uh, the club started to change and they became a little less heavy uh, than they were in the gutty era. And um, all of that is to say uh, that I, I think, you know, if you really wanted to be specific, you could come up with maybe two or three different eras of smooth face clubs uh, that kind of, again, coincide with the ball that was, was primarily used in that time frame. Uh, but for the purposes of trying to get people interested in gutty golf, um, I think it's important to kind of expand the equipment range that you can use uh, with the McIntyre braid or the park ball or even just the low compression Wilson Duo Soft, which is what a lot of folks use with their gutty sets. Um, you know, the whole idea here is to get more people playing the game. And so I think you do need to lax the equipment guidelines just a bit. And maybe in future events, there can be some specificity where you've got a division that's just all authentic clubs. And then the next division are clubs that are outside of the range of pre-1900, but are still smooth face. Uh, and maybe you include replica clubs in that division as well, because to me personally, there's a difference between a replica gutty club and an authentic gutty club. Um, I just, and I, I'm biased because I like the authentics, but I think it would be important in a, in a true event or competitive event to make a distinction between those that are using authentic clubs and those that are using replicas. Uh, but that's just my two cents. So um, that said, though, you know, I'm, I'm all for trying to get more people involved in gutty golf. And from my perspective, being an authentic player, uh, mostly authentic player, and also somebody who's trying to get more people just rehabbing authentic clubs, um, I'm going to focus on, you know, collecting as many smooth face clubs as I can uh, with the intent of building beginner sets for gutties. So that's all to say that I picked up a lot of gutty or a lot of smooth face clubs on this trip. And um, I want to show you a few of those here in a second. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, like I said, I hit up, um, a couple of private collectors, uh, one in particular that I'm really excited to show you, uh, their collection. Uh, it's actually a recently acquired batch of clubs that if I'm not mistaken, uh, is the largest collection of Hickory golf clubs in the country. Um, the person who owns it is Micah Bosman. He's in Wisconsin. And, uh, the person who owned it before him was Max Hill down in Texas. So older collectors are familiar with Max, and they're familiar with Micah, too. Micah's been doing this for a long time. Uh, and you can find him on eBay. I believe his handle on eBay is bboz, so B-B-B-O-S, something like that. But most of his listings now are listed out of Oak Brook, Illinois. So if you see anything close to bboz from Oak Brook, Illinois, that's, you know, it's uh, Micah. Um, and I think he's a really reputable, uh, you know, uh, trustworthy seller on eBay. Um, you know, I've, when people ask me about buying clubs on eBay, 
I only give a handful of folks names for people to look. And um, yeah, Mike is certainly one of them. Uh, I've bought clubs from him in the past that I've been very happy with, and they're all true to the description. And that's kind of the trick is like sometimes you see um, what I would consider to be incomplete or inadequate descriptions of clubs on eBay. Uh, maybe it's somebody who just doesn't know much about the club, or maybe it is somebody who knows about the club, but they're just kind of purposefully not giving you certain information that would give you a good idea as to whether or not it's a good buy uh, or a good player. Um, Micah gives you as much information as he has about the club and is happy to look up more information on it if you reach out to him and ask him for something more specific. So, um, yeah, my list of eBay uh, folks that you can trust is, is fairly short, but I'm happy to share that with you if you reach out to me privately. I don't want to put anybody on blast uh, uh, through the video, um, but there are some names that I would uh, definitely recommend you seek out on eBay. So, uh, kind of sidetracking myself, uh, Micah... Recently acquired the Max Hill Collection. Uh, if you follow anybody on social media related to Hickory Golf, you may have noticed in mid-March some posts of just an incredible amount of clubs uh, being moved uh, with the help of the Wisconsin Hickory Golfers. Micah reached out to the Wisconsin Hickory Golfers and they helped him physically move uh, some of those clubs into the space that Micah has recently purchased in Wisconsin. Um, and uh, so I took a visit to Micah's spot and uh, <laughs> took a look at the clubs there. And uh, to say it's overwhelming is a, is a gross understatement. Um, it's just an incredible amount of clubs. And, and Micah uh, estimates that he's probably already sold uh, about 1,500 of those clubs, at least when I got up there in um, uh, early April. Um, but by this point, I'm sure he's sold more than that still. Uh, when I was there, he estimated there were about 14 thousand to fifteen thousand clubs still in this garage space all right folks hickory hacker here and i'm standing in front of the largest collection of hickory golf clubs that i've ever seen and that i think uh, probably exists in the country right now this is the former max hill collection which is now owned by micah bozeman and we are at an undisclosed location i'm not going to give any more detail than that but I uh, just wanted to give you a look at what about 15,000 Hickory Golf Clubs looks like. Um, obviously, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm six foot two. I'm standing next to it right now. I would say that it's about, oh, five feet tall, this stack. So there's kind of looking at it from a distance. And just in case you think that these are all just random common clubs in here, just taking a quick look at anything that's sticking out. Here we've got a Winton Niblick. Up here we've got a Maxwell Hosel. Looks like it might be a Jigger or a Mid-Iron. There is quality stuff in here. It's not just quantity. Um, but here's what I'm gonna say. So if you're interested in finding out what's in this collection, don't just send Micah an email asking him for a specific club. He doesn't have the time to look through all these clubs. Um, for the one specific club that you might need. I'll tell you what though, it's probably in here. So what you need to do is contact Micah and set up an appointment to come out here. Um, he'll tell you where to go when you make the appointment because like I said, I'm not making a, I'm not gonna make this too public about where we're at right now. But um, yeah, help him out that way. Help him look for the club that you're looking for. He's going to organize these, but as you can imagine, it's going to take a long time to get through all of this and organize it uh, and inventory it. So eventually he'll have a pretty good idea of what's in here. But for now, it's just, this is the way it is. You got to come out here and look for yourself. Take some time. He's happy to, you know, kind of work on what he's doing while you're looking through clubs. Um, but do him that favor because otherwise it's, it's just not going to be a very efficient process for him to, to move these clubs. So I'm just going to kind of scan what we got going on here. There are some clubs that have already been separated uh, thanks to help from uh, Wisconsin Hickory Golfers. Uh, but you scan over here, more separation. We've got putters over here. I'm not even going to guess what that is. It's like jelly beans in a, in a jar as to what <laughs> how many clubs there might be there. Over here, we've got all of the woods that have already been separated out. And I'm pretty sure they've got most of the woods kind of uh, separated from everything else, as far as I can tell. We've got a bag of splice necks right here. And uh, I know that there's a little bit of everything in here. There's some Gutty Era Smooth Face, um, obviously some Maxwell Hosel, 
um, you know, a lot of flange clubs that I'm seeing just scanning around. So I'm going to spend about an hour here looking through, um, trying to find some common clubs to build beginner sets with and just uh, maybe some smooth face clubs for my own gutty sets. And I know this won't be the last time that I'm visiting up here um, and seeing what's what's here. And as I get some specific club uh, clubs that I'm looking for, you know, I'll try to remember what I see today. Um, but anyway, yeah, just wanted to show you what is an incredible stash of clubs or collection of clubs at this point. And uh, one last thing I'll say is if uh, your spouse or partner complains about how many clubs you've got in your basement, uh, just take a picture or show them this video and say it could be a lot worse. But uh, I just spoke with Micah and he's enjoying this whole process despite how much work this really is. Uh, you know, there's it's cool to have this many clubs, but it's a little overwhelming to figure out how you're going to move them all. So just wanted to give anybody who comes here a word of warning. Uh, these stacks are like Jenga. So if you go down here and you see a cool Stuart putter, which I just recently saw, um, and you try to pull it out, it's going to start slipping the entire stack on top of you. So be very careful if you come here and Mike is not standing here with you and you start looking through them because uh, it can get dicey fast. So yeah, for instance, here's a Stewart. There's, like I mentioned earlier, there is quality in this quantity uh, for sure. And um, I, I saw a cool Stewart down here toward the bottom and didn't think anything of it, just started pulling on it. And all of a sudden the top part of this started sliding down. You can see how precarious that is. So. Just a word of warning uh, that it's actually a pretty dangerous work here. So again, I mentioned to Micah that I was looking for uh, smooth face clubs, nondescript smooth face, face clubs, not anything necessarily collectible, um, but clubs that were playable that I could put into beginner sets for, for folks. And I think Micah's seen my, my channel or had seen my channel before um, I got there. So he's familiar with what I do and, and how I'm trying to get people interested in hickory golf. Um, so he said, well, have at it, see what you can find. And, and, you know, I'll give you a good price for whatever you find. So, and he certainly did that. Um, if you have any question about how much he's charging, um, all I can say is don't worry about it. Go there, try to see what you can find and he'll make a deal for you where everybody's happy. So, um, anyway, I think I ended up picking up about 25 smooth face clubs and, you know, I was there for about an hour and a half and I barely scratched the surface of what was there, but I did find a lot of clubs in that hour and a half that I just set aside. So, um, you know, I, what I'm trying to do with the gutty sets, uh, first of all, if you have no smooth face clubs whatsoever and you want to start from scratch, I really think you only need four clubs for a gutty set. Um, you need something to tee off with. So if you don't have a splice neck wood um, or a replica from Kelly Leonard, um, which I highly recommend uh, you, you check his stuff out if you really get into gutty golf. Um, if you don't have a wood, the next best thing is probably a clique, a, you know, a, um, a, a long or a low lofted clique. Uh, so those are actually fairly easy to find um, relatively, you know, relative to the woods for sure. Um, and so I picked up a lot of cliques. Um, I got several of them. This is a Carruthers Hazel uh, clique. Uh, these uh, close-ups will show up here as I'm talking. Um, but uh, I couldn't tell what the maker was on this. There is some information there, but I couldn't really decipher it. Um, but I would estimate this club to be 1902, 1903 thereabouts. And uh, it's 19 degrees. It's C2 on the swing weight scale. So it's a little light, lighter than I prefer. Um, but I think for somebody getting into uh, gutty golf, this would be um, a decent club to, to start with, at, at least getting yourself off the tee. Now, the, the situation with any golf club is that, um, you know, the lower the loft, the harder it's going to be to hit. And that's certainly, you know, the case with hickory clubs as well. Um, but I will say that once you get somewhat proficient with being able to hit these lower lofted cliques that pretty much have no offset, you're going to become a better player all around because you'll, you know, you're going to be making sweet spot contact and you're going to be grooving your swing and your tempo to maximize sweet spot contact. And that's going to carry over to other clubs. So it's sort of a training, um, you know, training module to, to a degree of using these clubs off the tee. Um, but in lieu of finding a wood, a splice neck wood, that would obviously be easier to get the ball, you know, get a gutty off the, the sand tee with. Um, I think a, a long, you know, a low lofted clique 
is the way to go. So I've, I've sourced several of these for the beginner sets. Now, if you start teeing off with this clique and you just can't get along with it, the next best thing to tee off with would be your general iron or your mashy. And uh, I'm recommending people try to find one in the 25 to 35 degree range uh, because that's pretty, you know, just like a mashy is with the modern hickory set, the uh, smooth face uh, general iron or mashy uh, is also a very versatile club and gutty. So you could certainly tee off with that as well. You're going to lose some distance, obviously, but uh, it'll be a consistent club for you getting it out into the fairway. And so I picked up several of clubs in that range as well. Um, the one that I'm specifically excited about uh, is the J.H. Taylor Mashy. Um, in one of my course vlogs late last year, I gave folks a glimpse of the J.H. Taylor, uh, Taylor's Mashy that I use. I estimate the date on that one based on the stampings to be uh, 1898, 1899, and I'll show a picture of that one here in a second, um, or I'll show it as I'm talking right now on the video. Uh, but using that club, I realized just how useful it is uh, for a variety of shots. And, um, you know, as far as gutty is concerned, I think it's an ideal gutty club. Uh, so I was excited in Micah's collection to find two more uh, Taylor's mashies. And so that's this club here. Um, this one is D7, 36 degrees. So it's right in the wheelhouse of what I recommend somebody look for for their, uh, you know, general iron to mashy club range. So there's that. And then finally, a lofter is the next club that I think uh, you need in your gutty set, the next of the four clubs. Um, and uh, this particular one is interesting. Uh, it's a, a Forester, uh, really heavy. It's F F0, so it's a very heavy club. But I picked up a lot of clubs in the 40 degree to 45 degree range that are technically... Um, lofters, but also probably high lofted mashies. Um, so there's a, you know, a little bit of gray area as to what the, the specific name of those clubs would be, but generally uh, it's a lofter. And um, the reason why I really like these clubs, well, there's a lot of reasons, but for building a set, the best reason is because it makes it so that you don't need to find a small head or rut niblick. Probably the most collectible of gutty clubs to find and hardest to find uh, and certainly hard to find one that you would want to play. Um, I have a couple. Well, actually, I only have one right now. Um, I sold the previous one I had. But it's, you know, here's the thing of it is um, it's it's always nice to be able to say you've got what would have been used back then. Uh, but the rut niblick, uh, a.k.a. small-headed niblick, um, is such a specific club and has such, had such a specific purpose in that time uh, that it really, it's not as versatile as I think you, it needs to be in order for you to, you, you know, find one and pay the amount of money for one and use it in a play set. If you're a collector, uh, that's a different story. But if you're just trying to get an experience with gutty golf, I don't think you need to find the small head niblick to finish out a playable set. Um, I think you can get by with a 40 to 45 degree lofter, uh, especially one that's heavy, because it'll be able to get through the grass and, and do what the rut niblick, small head niblick uh, was meant to do, which was basically just extract a ball from a tight lie uh, or a difficult lie. Um, if you've watched uh, Tommy's Honor, um, the uh, story about young Tom Morris, um, the movie, um, you, you see in that, in that movie that he's using, a, he, he discovers how you can put backspin using the niblick. And... Um, you know, if you're Tom, if you're young Tom Morris, then yeah, maybe that was possible. Uh, but certainly in the hands of the Hickory Hacker, all I've been able to do with my Tom Stewart rut niblick or Tom Stewart small head niblick is get it out of uh, a tight lie, or not a tight lie, but like a really ruddy lie um, where you wouldn't want to use something else or you couldn't use something else. I've never been able to use that club for a full swing um, or, or any kind of finesse shot. Um, so... Maybe uh, in time I'll, I'll get more proficient with that club, but my personal experience with it has, has shown me that it's a very specific club for a specific purpose. And if you're just trying to build a gutty set you, you really that you can play, you don't really need to worry about finding that small-headed niblick. Uh, you can get by with the lofter. So that's that. And then finally, uh, I, let me see if I can find it here without these clubs falling on me. This was the club that I pulled out of the wall of putters. It's a pre-registration Tom Stewart. 
So pre-registration simply means that the only marking here with the pipe is the pipe mark itself. It doesn't have any of the registered trademark information underneath that. That information started in 1904, I believe. And so any club that is stamped with the pipe mark for Stewart prior to 1904 doesn't have that registration information. And if you're playing in the National Hickory Championship and want to follow their guidelines, uh, it's an important criteria to keep uh, mindful of when you're using Tom Stewart clubs because they don't allow post-registration Tom Stewart smooth faces, but they do allow pre-registration Tom Stewart smooth faces. So this one caught my eye for that reason. Um, you know, I, I try to build my own personal gutty sets uh, by the same criteria that P. Georgity uses for the NHC, uh, partly because if I, you know, I am going to play in the NHC this year, so that's one reason, you know, I want to make sure the clubs that I'm comfortable with are going to be useful and, and uh, loud in his event. Um, but also, I like, the, I like having some parameters. You know, Pete's done a lot of research into, uh, you know, what clubs were appropriate for a true gutty experience and which clubs he had to make some exceptions for just to make sure that enough clubs were available for people to use to play in his events. So, um, you know, generally speaking, Pete's event is a pre-1900 Gutty event, uh, but the uh, pre-registration Tom Stewart clubs uh, were made up until 1904, as I just mentioned, and also BGI, which is a pretty easy club to find as far as smooth face goes, and also carries many of the characteristics of a older style gutty club. Those were made into the 19, early 1900s as well, I believe 1902 or 1903. So those are the exceptions, main exceptions that um, uh, Pete Georgity sets out for uh, being able to use uh, post 1900 clubs in the NHC. And then there are some other exceptions as well. Um, some Spalding clubs. In fact, I have one here. Um, oops. Um, if you come across Spalding Morristown clubs that just say Morristown and don't have the Spalding baseball stamp uh, associated with them, these clubs are also eligible for NHC play. Um, and also, again, like the BGI clubs, they carry a lot of the old style uh, techniques with, with how they were made so that they, you know, more or less, they, they pretty much are gutty clubs, even though they were made into the Haskell era. Um, so this is another one I picked up from Micah as well. So those are just a few of the clubs. Oh, well, anyway, let me finish my thought, thought about the uh, what you need for a gutty set. So that and a putting clique, you've got the, you know, the, the club you're going to use off the tee, which um, for most people will probably be a clique. Then you've got your general iron or mashie. Uh, in the 25 degree to 35 degree range. Then you've got your lofter in a 35 to 45 degree range, preferably 40 to 45 and, and heavier. And then you've got your putting cleat. That's four clubs. That's all, in my opinion, you need in order to play gutty golf and have a pretty authentic experience. So uh, let's see, what else did I pick up that I can show you here? Um, well, I did visit Bryant Murphy. Uh, I've mentioned his space. He's got an antique booth in Lake Geneva that's full of golf memorabilia. So again, if you're in Wisconsin, you got to go check out Micah's collection by reaching out to him and, and arranging an, a, an appointment there. But then go to Lake Geneva and check out Bryant Murphy's antique booth. Um, and what Bryant, uh, what I picked up from Bryant this time, again, more smooth face clubs. Um, these are interesting. So he had two sets, basically, of, and, and by sets, I mean like, you know, three to five clubs uh, where you've got the loft gaps that you'd want in the kind of beginner sets that I'm talking about. Um, these were made by a company in Chicago uh, that had a really cool, and you'll see a picture of this here in the video, a really cool clique mark, which is a sun that spells out the, world, the word restless. They kind of came up with a proprietary metal for their clubs and they are, they are actually restless. Uh, they're also very heavy. So that makes them uh, pretty good candidates for an authentic gutty club, even though these were probably made 1908 to 1910, something like that. They were only around a couple years. Um, so they're certainly past the era of, of the gutta percha ball, um, but still the way that they were made makes them uh, useful clubs for playing gutty. So uh, Bryant had two sets of these. I bought one of them and he gave me the other set to refurb for himself so that he could play gutty. Um, and so I'm excited about these, you know, I'm from the Chicago area originally, and, uh, these will be cool to have around as a, um, you know, a fun Chicago gutty set. 
Um, and there's some cool details in these. I may do a, a separate video on these in the future uh, because this company was doing some interesting things uh, as far as club design was concerned uh, for a very brief period of time. So yeah, I picked up a bunch of clubs that I'm intending on building uh, beginner sets with for Gutty. Um, I have a lot of Gutty coverage coming up on the channel uh, soon through the course vlogs. And um, I'm just excited to kind of get, you know, just as I was excited to get people interested in modern, what I'm calling modern hickory pre-1935, I'm even more excited to get people interested in trying pre-1900 uh, Gutty Golf and uh, even pre-1850 Feathery Golf. If you can, you know, and I'll get into what I what I'm considering to be some equipment exceptions for that, so you know it's more accessible for folks that don't have the feathery clubs, replica feathery clubs that I have. Um, but yeah, I just think it's you know it's a different game than hickory golf than modern hickory golf when you play gutty, uh, and feathery is very different from gutty and obviously from modern hickory. So um, while it's all considered hickory golf. Um, on the surface, you can really kind of narrow down and, and get some pretty interesting authentic experiences uh, by trying to source as close to authentic clubs as you can or using replica woods where necessary. And, and that is the exception that I bring up when I'm talking to somebody about authentic versus replica clubs. You know, the, the Kelly Leonard uh, McEwen Play Club that I use here in my gutty set uh, is a replica, obviously, because you wouldn't want to use a pre-1900 long nose club. It's just not a good idea. You know, if it breaks, then you're going to feel terrible about it. And Kelly Leonard uh, is part of a small group of people who have done the research and uh, have the craftsmanship skills to make these clubs as close to authentic as possible. This is pretty cool. Um, if you've watched the Brad Corando uh, videos that I've been posting uh, where he shows his long nose play clubs and how he made his shafts and then the splice extension project that he showed me how to do properly, this was the jig that he has on his table uh, for holding shafts. And uh, it's something that he came up with. Uh, some of, it's not a, a unique design to him necessarily, but there are some details to this that he added to it based on his own experience uh, you working on shafts. So I bought one of these from him because I loved the way that his worked for him on his workbench. And I'm excited to, uh, do more projects with shafts using this. So I was excited about that pickup. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Uh, I guess the last thing I'll show you here is this sign. I picked this up in a, uh, antique store in Scranton, uh, near Scranton, Pennsylvania. I believe it was probably from a larger city park uh, up there somewhere where they obviously didn't want somebody like me going out there with a golf club and some balls uh, hitting around. Um, so I thought that was fun and that'll make an appearance in, in the studio uh, at some point. But anyway, that, yeah, that, that just wraps up what I've picked up over the last two and a half weeks in uh, the Midwest and then headed back to Connecticut. Um, you know, the trips are long and I'm always very happy to be back home when I get back home, but it's also really cool to make new connections with people, to see old friends. I played some great golf, you know, the weather wasn't, wasn't great as it usually is the case in early, uh, April, uh, driving through the Midwest, uh, but it was a great time. And I'm always excited to share with you what I find, uh, and encourage you to go out and look for this stuff too, you know, I, I'm not really, the only exception I can say about myself and finding this stuff is that I'm doing it all the time. Uh, but there is a lot of it out there to be found. And uh, all you got to do is take a drive and go to an antique store you haven't been before and, and then go to that antique store again two months later. If, you know, it's an antique mall, especially, there's always new stuff popping up in those places. You know, the, the really motivated um, antique booth operators are going to estate sales, picking stuff up, putting it in their booth. So there's always new stuff to find. And, you know, I can't say this enough. They literally made millions of clubs in the Hickory era. So there are so many of these clubs still floating out there waiting to be found and refurbished and played. And uh, highly encourage you to continue looking for them as well. All right. Well, that'll do it for this week. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope I wasn't rambling on too long. Um, and uh, I'll be back next week with another course vlog. Uh, in the meantime, here are a couple videos for you to check out from the archive. And as always, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.